Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's get started. The end approaches. Let's talk a little bit about the final project. Um, weekly milestones. For the undergraduates, you are done with weekly milestones. You have none assigned today. You have none due on Monday. If you looked at the schedule yesterday, you would have seen a fifth milestone up here. That was my mistake. Um, I was just so excited for you to carry on with your A-B testing that I assigned you an extra milestone. What I want the undergraduates to do is, uh, you were asked last week in milestone four to show us preliminary evidence of your A-B testing. Some of you are there, some of you are still working out the kinks in your a, version A and version B, that's fine. From now until you present your final project, on Tuesday, May the 9th, I want you to continue on with A-B testing. So let's talk about A-B testing again. We've talked about it a few times. What you are going to try and do on May 9th in two and a half minutes is show us two things. You're gonna show us a video of an evolved robot and a robot controlled by a random controller and we should be able to see in looking at those two videos a difference that you've been able to evolve locomotion, obstacle avoidance, climbing on top of one another, whatever your task is, that we can see that evolution actually occurred. Yeah? Second thing you're gonna try and show us is results from your A-B test, that there was some difference between A and B, or that there was no difference between A and B. Yeah? That's a successful A-B test. An unsuccessful A-B test is, I did a couple of runs of A and I did a couple of runs of B and I can't really tell. Maybe A's better, maybe B's better, maybe there's no difference between A and B. Yeah, That is what you do not want to do. And the way to avoid that is to get as much data as possible. To do as many independent evolutionary runs of version A of your code and as many independent evolutionary runs of version B of your code as possible, right? Imagine I flip a coin twice, once it comes up heads, once it comes up tails. And I tell you, look, it's an unbiased coin. It comes up heads and tails 50% of the time, as you can see from this data. Do you believe me? Probably not, right? If I, if I flip that coin 100 times, and it comes up, comes up heads 53% of the time and tails 47% of, of the time, it's still not guaranteed, it's still not proven, but the evidence is now in my favor if I claim this is an unbiased coin. Yeah? Okay. So that's what we're looking for in A-B testing. What is, what, is, what is the difference that you're looking for between version A and version B? Is that whatever, you cha whatever change you made between these two versions of your code, it's making it harder or easier for evolution to evolve whatever it is you want to evolve for your robot. Right? If you're evolving obstacle, uh, obstacle avoidance and version A is your robot has no hidden neurons, and version B is it has hidden neurons, and it turns out that in B, you're able to evolve better obstacle avoidance. There's only one difference between version A and B, which is the presence or absence of hidden neurons, and you can point to that as the culprit. That's why it was easier or harder for evolution to evolve obstacle avoidance. I was wondering if you could discuss I assume we're not just supposed to eyeball it, so I was wondering if you could talk about how we put together all those cards we do. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So, right, rather than just eyeball it, what, what sort of data can you present, right? The, the simplest thing to present is fitness curves, like we've seen many, many times in this course now. So on the horizontal axis, you might have the number of generations, and on the horizontal axis, you have fitness here and assume that in my final project, higher fitness is better. Yeah, I do one run of A and I get this. A1, my first run of A, I get this. I do a run of B and get better, better obstacle avoidance. Yeah, there you go, I'm done. I put hidden neurons in version B of my code and therefore I conclude that hidden neurons are better for, ob uh, they facilitate the evolution of obstacle avoidance. Do you believe me? Hopefully not, right? Okay, so do another one run of uh, A. Aha, okay. 
Another run of B. Looking like there's maybe not a difference, right? And, and so on. Keep going. You can show us these two groups, and if one group of fitness curves is clearly higher than the other for enough curves, that's sufficient. Yeah? Some of you have taken statistics classes. Some of you haven't. Some of you know how to conduct a test for significance about whether or not the group of A curves is higher or lower than the group of B curves. But doing a statistical test and trying to prove significance in this course is not required because not everybody has a statistics background. Uh, so in the traditional parallel bookminer algorithm that we built, the, each uh, uh, robot in the population size is basically just a parallel algorithm. So can each of those be counted as a trial? Great question, yeah. So let's go back to my example here. I have two curves of A and two curves of B. I'm assuming, or I'm claiming in this picture that these two curves are independent of one another. Yeah, what does it mean for them to be independent? In the case of the parallel hill climber, if you have a population size of 10, each of those 10 lineages are genetically distinct from one another, right? There's been no mixing of genomes. That's true in the parallel hill climber. If you've tackled the genetic algorithm, they are no longer independent because there is crossover and there's mixing of genetic material between them. So you can't take the 10 best robots from the end of a genetic algorithm run and plot 10 fitness curves because those 10 curves would not be independent. Yeah? You can in the parallel hill climber. Yeah? So if you run a parallel hill climber on your laptop overnight with a population size of 10 in the morning, you have 10 curves available. If you run your parallel hill climber again the next night, you have another 10 curves. If you run your laptop overnight with a population size of 50 of the parallel hill climber, you now have 50 curves at your disposal. I can't remember if you recommended a number of generations. I didn't see any in the document. Okay, so how many generations do you run? That's another good question. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. Yeah. So the question that always comes up in A-B testing is how, how many curves do you need? And I can't give you an answer to that because it's going to depend on what your A and your B is. Yeah? You may, unbeknownst to you, uh, have an A and a B in which there is a very slight evolutionary advantage for B, meaning that you're going to have your two sets of curves be very, very close to one another. which means you're going to have to do more runs to prove there is actually a difference here. You might find, uh, alternatively, that your A and B is really different. Whatever you put into version B of your code, or whatever you took out of your version B of your code, it really helps or it really hurts evolution. And you do a couple of runs of A and B, and you're going to see that there is a huge separation between them. Yeah? If I flip a coin 10 times and it comes up heads, every time. Again, that's not proof that it's a biased coin, but it's looking pretty good, right? So the answer is how many runs do you have to do? How many runs of your parallel hill climber do you have to do? It depends. I can't tell you. Yeah? If you do have a bit of a statistics background and you know, know how to perform a statistical test and you know how to get back a p-value, by all means do that and report the p-value to us during your final project. That's fine. But your best friend in this final project will be data. The more runs of A and B you can collect, the better. Which means uh, something you probably don't want to do is leave your A and B coding until the night before you have to submit, because you've got now one night to collect enough A's and B's, enough coin flips to try and convince us A is better, B is better, or Look, here's proof that there is no difference between them. That is also fine. OK, how many generations do you need to run? That is a great question. Again, I don't have an answer for you. One thing you can do, and we haven't really talked about this in the course, you can consider this optional, is to do checkpointing. Checkpoint, what checkpointing is, is you run your code for five generations. You set it to a very low number. 
And at the end of five generations, your code writes out its entire state to disk. And then the next night, you can read it back in. And when you start up your code again, instead of starting at generation zero with a population of random robots, it's going to start with, it's going to load back in the state and continue. Yeah? So you could do, you could set up checkpointing and you could run 20 runs of A and 20 runs of B, but only for five generations. Let's assume that takes 10 minutes on your laptop. That's 20 times 10 minutes for all the A's and 20 times 10 minutes for all the B's. And if you start to see a difference already, you're done. Five generations is probably not gonna be enough for pretty much every A and B you can imagine. So the next night, you start up your code again, you load everything in from generation five, and it runs for another five generations. The next day, you look at your code now, you plot all these fitness curves, you look to see whether there's a difference between A and B, and you keep going. You know? Always best to do A-B testing breadth first. Yeah? So instead of doing uh, spending a week getting 10 runs of B and then hoping the next week to collect 10 runs of A or vice versa, you could be in trouble. Better to interleave A and B and even better implement checkpointing and do lots and lots and lots of A's for short periods of time, lots and lots and lots of B's. Next night, extend all of those runs by a couple more generations, extend and extend, right? You don't wanna put a huge amount of time in with your fingers crossed and hoping for the for the best. Do things in a breadth first manner. Yeah? Okay. For checkpointing, um, a good thing to use if you're not familiar with it already is the Python library called Pickle. It'll take the entire state of your code and pickle it and write it out to disk for you in a single line so you don't have to write out everything manually. And then Pickle has a load function that'll do the same thing. It'll read everything back in uh, for you. Yeah. So if you Google Python, checkpointing, pickle, there'll be some examples there of how to do it. Or I guess these days, ask ChatGPT to do it, and it'll probably do it for you. Any other questions about A-B testing? OK, a couple other things that uh, came up in office hours this past week. Um, how do you, uh, some of you are still struggling with how to incorporate new sensor data into a fitness function or how to create a different fitness function. So I just want to go over that one more time. I don't have my code base in front of me. If I did, I'd, I'd show you some of my code. I'll just ask you to try and recall the structure of your code base that you have at the moment. Remember, you have two running processes, one that's running the evolutionary algorithm. And the evolutionary algorithm, every once in a while, starts up an instance of simulate.py. Right? Simulate.py starts up, it reads in the body and the brain of a robot, or for some of you robots, if you're doing a swarm now, reads in all of that information, simulates your robot or robots for however many time steps. For some of you it's a thousand, for some of you now it's 10,000 time steps. And at the end of that time, in, uh, in simulation.py, there's a function called getFitness or saveFitness that will write out to disk a single number, which is the fitness that's coming from that simulation. Yeah. At that moment in time, I forget whether it's called get fitness or save fitness, inside that class hierarchy, somewhere in that class hierarchy, there is a class instance called robot. Inside the class instance of robot, there are a bunch of sensors. And inside each of the sensor class instances, if you have four touch sensors, you probably have four instances of the sensor class. If you have eight sensors, you've got eight instances of the sensor class. It's all stored in a dictionary. If you go into each of those class instances, you'll find a NumPy vector that has all of the sensor information inside. Yeah? So by the time you get to the end of the simulation, Every percent, everything that the robot has experienced from its sensors is stored for you, and you can pull out that information and combine it in whatever way you want. So far, so good. 
The tricky thing, of course, is that that data is sprinkled across this class hierarchy. So you've got to use your, you've got to write some code that dives down into and collects all of that information. For some of you, you need all of that touch information not in four or eight vectors of length 1,000, if you have a 1,000 time steps. You need it put into a matrix of uh, four rows or eight rows and 1,000 columns because you need to look uh, across and down the matrix. Yeah? For some of you that are evolving jumping, for example, or evolving, um, I'm forgetting it, uh, Pronking, thank you. Pronking, you need to detect whether all touch sensors were reporting minus one at the same time. Yeah? That information means you need to punch through a given column in the four or eight vectors, which you could write some code to do that. Better yet, take all those vectors, reformat them into a matrix, and then look at the columns to see whether there are columns with all minus ones in them. Yeah? If, you're, uh, if you're a little bit rusty or not that familiar with NumPy about how to put vectors into matrices and look for contiguous sets of values, Stack Overflow is probably your best friend at this point. Or again, I'll bet you ChatGPT can probably tell you how to put NumPy vectors into a matrix. Or better yet, probably show you. Yeah? Okay. Any other questions or things I can help with with the final project? Okay. All right. Back to our final theme uh, of the course where we're broadening out the evolutionary algorithm so that we are evolving now not populations of neural networks. We are now evolving populations of robots. Every genotype that we're going to see from now until the end of the course has information about how to modify or set the body and the brain of the robot. Yep, that's the genotype. We're looking, we're gonna be looking in lectures 24, 25, 26, and 27, how those genotypes are turned into phenotypes, the thing, the robot, yeah? Okay, we started in last time by looking at the very first attempt to do this, which shocked the robotics world way back in 1994. Uh, this was work done by the computer graphics researcher, Carl Sims. I won't play the video again, but just so you remember, he created an evolutionary algorithm in which the genomes are being translated into phenotypes of very diverse forms. It, it's not quadrupeds with legs of different lengths. They are completely different body forms. This is a very uh, general purpose uh, evolutionary algorithm. We saw why he did it. Uh, it was meant to be a demo for the then state-of-the-art uh, connection machine five, the supercomputer. Uh, and we ended last time by starting to look at the evolutionary algorithm. Um, we've looked at lots of different evolutionary algorithms that encode their genotypes in different data structures. We introduced uh, Carl Sims's genotypes here, which are graphs. Graphs are made up of nodes and edges. These particular graphs have three, uh, um, uh, have three descriptors along with them. They are multigraphs meaning there can be multiple edges leaving uh, the same node and arriving at the same node. They are directed graphs because the edges connecting nodes together are directed. They're arrows, not lines. And we'll talk about the nested part of the graph uh, shortly. The phenotypes, this is a little bit more familiar, simulated robots made up of links and joints connecting those links uh, together. We discussed last time how this graph genotype, each node and each edge in this graph has uh, a bunch of information attached to it. Each node has a set, a set of labels and each edge has a set of labels. And these labels are basically parts of a blueprint. They describe how to alter the construction process 
of the robot. So just to refresh our memory, let's take this particular genotype here. Inside this node, there's information about the body part dimensions, the length, width, and height of the rectangular solid that should be built. So we visit this node, we take those dimensions, we build that uh, piece, we then go out along these edges, and as we leave this node and travel along, for example, the left edge first, we encounter in that edge a bunch of deltas, a bunch of things that tell us how to alter the information that we're carrying with us as we traverse the genotype. One of the things uh, that we take along with us is the XYZ position at which we just constructed uh, a body part. We're taking the yaw, pitch, and roll, the orientation of the part that we just built, and we're taking the scale along with it, the length, width, and height of the object that we just built. And as we move along that edge, it gives us a delta in position, it gives us a delta in orientation, and if I could shrink my phone here, it gives us a delta in length, width, and height. Yeah. That leads us to when we arrive back at a node to create a new body part, and onward and onward. Yeah. So as we traverse this graph, we start building links we also leave behind us not just links, but joints connecting those links together. And information about those joints is also stored inside these nodes. It seems like it would be intuitive if the nodes in the genotype correspond to body parts and the edges in the genotype correspond to joints, but that is not the case. A node tells us how to build a body part and if it's a non-root body part, it also tells us how to connect that newly created body part back to the body part we just left. Yeah? Okay. One of the nice things about this, at first, seemingly non-intuitive genotype to phenotype mapping is that it leads to recursive structures. So I mentioned the genotype to phenotype mapping last time is recursive. It gives us fractal structures. It gives us repetition. It gives us symmetry. Where have we seen this before? We've seen an evolutionary algorithm that was also designed to bias evolution, to produce things that are not just random collections of parts, but tends to produce things that have symmetry, repetition, variations on a theme, and so on. Hyper neat, exactly, yeah? So there have been a couple attempts over the years to, to create genotypes that tend to unpack or unfold into non-random phenotypes, things with repetition, uh, symmetry, fractalness, or uh, scale invariance, if you like, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, we were going through the list of node labels and edge labels last time. Uh, I wanna just finish by talking about the terminal only flag down here. This one's uh, kind of interesting. This is stored in the edges. It's a flag, and that reminds us that it's a binary value. It's either zero or uh, one. If in a particular node, there, the terminal only flag is set to one or true, Remember, there is also the recursive limit, which is an integer stored in nodes. So the recursive limit, every time we leave a node, we decrease the recursive limit in that node by one so that we don't keep traversing this graph forever. You can see, for example, in the tree genotype here, it, we leave this node, travel along edges, and come back to the same node. How do we know how to finish? We'd be creating a tree of infinite depth. Yeah? The recursive limit tells us when to stop. When we travel along an edge and we arrive at a node and the node's RL limit is set to zero, the node is basically saying, stay out. You're, we're done. Stop constructing the phenotype. The terminal only flag is sort of an exception. If we're traveling along an edge and we arrive at a node and the recursive limit is zero, 
but the terminal only flag uh, is true, that node basically says, ignore me, but go along this special edge. There's one other node you haven't visited yet, and I only want you to visit that node when you're done with me. Seems like this odd, weird detail. Why did Sims put this detail in here? It lets you put like hands at the end of arms and stuff like that. Absolutely, right? So if we look at our little humanoid down here, uh, there is one node down here called the, leg, the limb segment that has a self connection. So that self connection will create the upper arm, then we travel around and it'll create the lower arm. There's a recursive limit in there that stops things after two visits. You could imagine an additional node, which is not here, called hand. You could imagine a, an edge that connects limb segment to hand and a terminal only flag in limb, limb segment that says, if you, if you come to me and my recursive limit is, is at zero, go along this edge to hand. Yeah. So this was Sims' way of allowing evolution to place additional material at the end of a repetition. Yeah. It's not shown in any of the pictures here, but I think you get the basic, you get the basic idea. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's test our knowledge of this genotype to phenotype mapping. This is probably the most complicated, this is the most complicated genotype and phenotype we're gonna see in this entire course. So let's practice using it. I want you to take any one of these 12 phenotypes, and if you've got pen and paper handy in front of you, see if you can write a genotype that if uh, expressed would produce that phenotype. Yeah. I'll give you a minute or two, or two to see if you can figure that out. So you're drawing one of these over here. You're creating nodes and edges. And you can add to some of those nodes and edges some of these labels. You don't have to add all of them. To sketch out something that would produce these phenotypes. Give it a try. And I'll give you a minute or two for that. And then we'll see uh, what you're able to come up with. Some are easier than others. Which ones are easier than others, do you think, and why? I think seven is really easy because it's just like using recursion on its own. OK. Yeah, seven is usually pretty easy. Should we give it a go? What's a genome that would produce that particular phenotype? If you have nodes with a recurring edge. Done. Yeah? OK. Not quite done. We need to add a, a couple of details. What are some of the hints here in the phenotype that suggest, or what are some details of the phenotype that give us a hint about what kinds of node labels or edges we would need for this genotype to produce that phenotype? It has eight levels of recursion, so okay. you know the limit's going to be eight. Yeah, and the recursive limit is in the nodes. So in here, we have a recursive limit of eight, which will produce the eight segments. We're going to start here, produce this part, go along this edge, which is going to bring us back here. It's going to tell us how to build this piece along this edge again, this piece, this piece, this piece. And by the time we build this piece, RL has been decreased to zero, so we stop. What else? We need a scale decrease on the edge. We need a change in the scale which is to decrease the size of these blocks by a little bit, right? Decrease the width and the height and the length by 10%, let's say, yeah? Okay, 
Others, let's try one more. Again, some are easier than others. How about this one here? Our fish with six fins. What would the general structure of the genotype look like to produce that phenotype? The body node going back to itself and then two edges going off that to a fin node. Okay, body node with a self edge and two edges using this idea of the multigraph because we want to place two fins on each body segment. Yeah, So we've got three body segments, so we probably want a recursive limit of three here. And we visit the fin and have no outgoing edges. A fin is just a single, a single piece. Yeah, looks good, right? We probably on the uh, on this edge here, we'd have something that alters the orientation of the body parts. You can see this body part has a different orientation to this body part. This body part has a different orientation relative to this body part. Yeah. Everybody get the basic idea of how this works? Okay, you can imagine mutations now coming in and hitting these different labels and edges. So let's go back to our six-finned creature over here. If a mutation hits the recursive limit and changes this integer to some other random integer, how is that going to affect the phenotype? <coughs> It'll, it'll make it longer. If this number becomes five, we're going to have a fish made up of five segments and ten fins, a decrease, same thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've introduced most of this evolutionary algorithm with one glaring omission so far. We've only been talking about the body. Where's the neural controller for these things? Yeah. Here it is. Okay. We're looking at a genotype over here. This genotype uh, looks very much like the one we just described over here. As I mentioned, these genotypes are nested graphs. A nested graph, as the name implies, is a graph made up of nodes and edges that has more graph structure nested inside. You can see inside this three node uh, genotype over here, there are additional nodes and edges embedded inside the nodes themselves. You'll notice that these nodes have sort of cryptic names associated with them. Not so easy to interpret what exactly they are, but some of you might be able to figure out some of them at this point. Any ideas? What do these nodes and edges represent inside the nodes and edges that make up the genotype. Any guesses? Aren't they like part of the activation function? So it's a wave absolute value and stuff? Aha. Uh -huh. Wave absolute function, sawtooth pattern. These are activation functions which is a strong hint that these nodes are asking for, or they are neurons, yeah? So the nodes here, the nodes here represent neurons, and the edges between them represent synapses, but they're embedded in the genotype, but they need to be embedded in the phenotype. We need to have the neurons and synapses in here, in the phenotype. So how do we take this information that's embedded in the genotype and move it into the phenotype. The way we're going to do this is as we're following, following the outer graph, the big nodes and edges, as we go, we're going to make copies of the neural material and paste it into the body as we construct the body. Yeah. So here we go. We're going to start at this node here. This node is going to tell us to build this body part right here. And there are three neurons here, and these are their three activation functions. 
We're going to take these three neurons and make copies of them and put them inside this body part. But they're disconnected neurons. They're not connected with any synapses yet. We're going to keep going. We're going to, uh, we're going to travel along both of these edges and build a left fin and a right fin. Each fin has to have the, should have these six neurons inside. So we're going to copy these six neurons and put them in here. When we make the second fin, we're going to make copies of these six neurons and put them in here. So at this point in time, we have three neurons inside here, six neurons inside here, six neurons inside here. No synapses yet. So far, so good? OK. Again, I apologize for the notation here. In my opinion, it's horrendous, but we'll do the best we can. Let's have a look at some of these neurons here. These ones have a greater than and plus sign. All of, these, uh, all of these notations that refer to something that looks like a function or a mathematical operator, these are all activation functions. These are activation functions we haven't seen so far. We're not going to talk about them in this class. They're not really relevant. Just for our purposes, they're neurons with different kinds of activation functions inside them. Yeah? OK. J1 and J2, the J stands for joints. These are joint sensors. Again, not great notation here. So when we build a fin, we're creating two joint sensors. Why two? Seems a little strange. It's a hint. It's a hint for how the fin is attached to the body segment. How so? How are they attached? It's, well, the, it needs to be able to move laterally as well as the other one. Up and down, yes. So this is a hint that when we connect this joint to this body segment, we're, we're attaching it not with the hinge joints that, we've been, that you've been using in this course, which has one degree of freedom. There's one way in which my lower arm can rotate relative to my upper arm. This is a hint that hinges here are attached with two degrees of freedom. It could be this one and this one. It could be this one and this one. So actually, that's a pretty good one to have if it's a fin. It's not specified in this cartoon. doesn't matter for our purposes. We're welding or we're connecting this fin to this body part with uh, joints that have two degrees of freedom. And we're attaching two sensor neurons that are watching those two angles. One is watching what this current angle is, and the other joint sensor neuron is watching what this angle is at any given point in time. So far, so good? So we construct this fin, we've dropped in two sensor neurons, and we attach those sensor neurons to the joint, connecting that fin back to its parent uh, body part. We have two other neurons here called E0 and E1. Again, terrible notation. Anybody want to take a guess? We've got a couple of sensor neurons here. We have neurons here with activation functions. What are we missing? Exit. Exit? Oh, good, good guess. These are the motor neurons. These are the motor neurons, yep. <laughs> they, sh they should have M's in front of them. E for effector. So in robotics, motors are sometimes called effectors. It's not, not great terminology to have two different words for the same thing, but these are the two motor neurons. And we have two motor neurons because we have a joint that has two degrees of freedom. One motor is applying torque, is applying rotational force to cause this motion. And the second effector neuron is sending commands to a second motor, which is applying rotational force or torque to do this, right? Or do this, whatever it happens to, to be. So in every fin, we're placing two sensor neurons and two motor neurons. And if you squint carefully, you'll see there's an edge connecting this sensor neuron to this motor neuron. So we take that synapse. We also copy it into this fin, and also into this fin, and into this fin, and into this fin, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So as we move about, as we traverse the genotype, we're constructing the body as we go, and we're also constructing the brain of this robot as we go. So far, so good. Any questions? 
So the like the J zero and J one and E zero and E one come from like the node that they're nested inside. Like they they come from the node they're nesting inside. What, what this part of the genotype is basically saying, the outer node is saying, build this body part, and every time you build this body part, put this neural circuit inside it. Yeah. So the reason why there's two of them is because like it's like the joint said the node said that there's like that kind of joint, but like where does the um the activation functions come from. Okay, uh, where do the activation functions come from? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment, but, but a good question here. Remember the big nodes and edges, the outer part of the genotype is encoding the body. So forget the neural circuitry again. This builds one body part, and then there's two outgoing edges that arrive at the same node. Those two edges are saying, and they, these two edges can have different deltas associated with them. One says, when you're at this body part and you leave the body segment, go left. The other edge says, when you leave this body segment, go right. Which means you've now reached two different parts. you reached two different locations on this body segment, on the body segment's left and on the body segment's right. And in both cases, at both locations, this node tells you what to build there, which is build the same thing, but in two different locations. Yeah. Okay, so where do the activation functions come from? These are the sensor neurons. So the values that are spat out by these neurons at every time step are the angles of the two, of the two degrees of freedom of the joint. The two values that are spat out by the two effector neurons are interpreted as torques, rotational forces. All these other neurons, therefore, must be, they're not sensor neurons, they're not motor neurons, hidden, they're hidden neurons, right? They're hidden from direct contact with the physical world. They're receiving, uh, along the edges that arrive at those nodes, they're receiving values from other neurons. They're combining all of that information together in the way all neural networks do. It's a weighted sum. We take that weighted sum, which is a single value, we push it through one of these, acti the activation function, which transforms that value into a new single value, and that single value gets pushed out along the outgoing synapses from that hidden neuron just like we've seen in pretty much every other experiment so far. The only difference here is that the neural network is now distributed or embedded in different parts of the body. Yeah? That we haven't really seen before. Everything we've seen up to this point, there's sort of the robot, and then there's this neural network that's arranged into a neat layer of sensors, hidden neurons, and motor neurons. Yeah? Not so in this experiment, and obviously not so in us. OK. What is this weird dashed circle up here? Right? Hopefully most of you are wondering that at this point. It is, not, it is not translated into a body part. What is it? We've got this little tiny neural circuit copied twice, once in here, a second time in here. This little neural circuit distributed, uh, copied four times into here, 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 and here. What's this represent? The brain? The brain, otherwise known as the central nervous system. Yeah? Everything above the top of your uh, throat is your CNS, your central nervous system. But pretty much every other part of your body has neural tissue inside it. You've got neurons and synapses distributed throughout your entire body. That is known as the peripheral nervous system. That also includes your spine. Yeah? It makes sense for very good evolutionary reasons to have local neural circuitry. And as the human species has demonstrated, there is an advantage to also centralizing neural, neural tissue in one, in one place. What's the advantage of have, for either for organisms or for robots to have neural tissue distributed throughout the body? Isn't there a reaction happening like on the sensory 
Reaction time is absolutely the reason why in organisms. For robots, maybe not so much, right? Maybe reaction time doesn't matter. You put your hand uh, on, a, on, a, on a, uh, an active stove, you don't have time for an electrical signal to travel up into the central nervous system to figure out what to do and send commands back to your uh, arm and hand, right? Any of you that have ever touched something really, really ha hot, you will immediately look down and realize that you've already removed your hand before you're even consciously aware of it, thanks to your peripheral nervous system. Yeah, Serves a very, very important role for organisms. Might not be so obvious for robots in which communication speed is, is very, very fast. Yeah? Okay, so this special node here, there is a special node that's included in the genotypes, which is not shown in the cartoon here. And evolution can put neurons and synapses in here. And the neurons and synapses that are placed in this special node, only one copy is made of those neurons and synapses. And they don't really have a location anywhere in the body. I mean, we can arbitrarily pick somewhere and say that they're in there. There's one copy which is meant to represent the central nervous system of these creatures. And you can see that there are synapses that travel from the CNS, from the brain, out to parts of the body. So this particular neuron here, there's one copy of this neuron in this virtual creature, and it has four outgoing synapses. Synapses that connect to each of these hidden neurons, one of which exists in each of the four fins. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so that, that hopefully uh, finishes our discussion of the genotypes. They are nested, directed, multigraphs. We've got joint sensors here. We have uh, effector sensors here. Carl Sims threw in additional sensor types like touch sensors or con what he called contact sensors. Photo sensors. You might remember in the video there was a little fish that was swimming after a red light. So these little virtual creatures, if there's a light source in their environment, they can see it. It's uh, some version of a Breitenberg vehicle. Okay. Uh, this is a full list, for those that are interested, this is sort of optional. This is a list of all the activation functions that Carl Sims included in his experiment. The only reason I want to point this out is in the last 10 years during this deep learning revolution that's led up to ChatGPT and Dolly and all this state-of-the-art AI, for several years out of these 10 years, there were arguments in the literature about which activation functions are better than others. It seemed like a crazy, esoteric, uh, useless argument. It seemed like a, a, a detail that didn't really matter. It's a detail that matters. If you want to make a big, large neural network like ChatGPT or Dolly or Stable Diffusion, the activation functions that exist in the many, many, many neurons inside those architectures they were picked very carefully and after years of argument and debate and A-B tests to see which are useful. And Sims actually, in many things, anticipated a lot of these uh, arguments and investigations years or in some cases decades before. Kind of interesting. Optional for our purposes. Okay, so uh, just for fun, here's a picture of the brain uh, sorry, here's a picture of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system inside this creature here. This creature has two body segments and four fins. And if you squint, you can see these two body segments. Here's body segment one, or here's the neural tissue inside body segment one, and here's the, ner the same neural tissue copied in the second body segment over here. Here's the peripheral ner nervous circuit in one of the four fins, same circuit, uh, sorry. Here's one neural circuit in one of the fins, 
to sensor neurons, to uh, hidden neurons, to motor neurons, same neural circuit in the second fin, same neural circuit in the third fin, same neural circuit in the fourth fin, and there is just one copy of saw waveform and ITP up here. This is the little tiny brain inside this fish. All good? Okay. All right. Back to the evolutionary algorithm. We now have populations of these graph uh, of these graphs and we're going to evolve them. Those that have higher fitness are gonna produce modified copies of themselves. Sims wanted to include not just mutation, as we talked about before, he wanted to include crossover as well. He wanted to cut two graphs and glue them together. Where did we see this challenge before? It's not so trivial to cut two graphs and glue them together and have a third graph that does better than the two parent graphs. Where have we seen this before? We looked at uh, we looked at an experiment that tried to find a way to do this so that the glued together child graph was as good as, if not sometimes better than both parents. Where did we see that before? Someone mentioned hyperneat. Hyperneat builds on top of the neat algorithm. And neat, the neat algorithm was designed with a particular crossover method inside that solved this problem. This particular paper was published before the neat algorithm was invented. So my guess is the crossover events that occurred in this experiment probably didn't work very well at all. The creatures that, the evolved creatures that you saw in the video that would run and jump and compete over a block, they were, I'm guessing they were probably a result of mutations. Crossovers probably, crossover events probably didn't do much at all. Anyways, just for completeness, how did Sims do this? He took all of these graphs and smooshed them into a one-dimensional line, took two surviving graphs, two surviving phenotypes that produced robots that did pretty well at whatever the fitness function was, squashed them and lined them up, and then started walking from left to right along one of the parents, and as, uh, as he went, he copied nodes and edges. Every once in a while, at random, he would jump from parent two to the same horizontal position. Oh, sorry, he would jump from parent one to the same horizontal <laughs> position in parent two and keep moving to the right, copy nodes and edges from parent two into this child, and then every once in a while, jump back to parent one and keep going. So he's walking from left to right, but jumping back and forth from parent one to parent two at random. Cutting up these graphs and gluing them together into a child graph, which would produce a child robot, and on you go. He had uh, multiple ways of doing this. We won't go into those details. Yeah, so mutation, crossover. We, last thing we need is a fitness function. Yeah, you can all guess what the fitness function was for locomotion or swimming, displacing one's own body in three dimensions. How about the competition that we saw at the end? We saw these two robots that were competing over a common resource, and we actually kind of discussed what the fitness function might be here. What did we come up with? If you're one of the two robots in this competition, what do you want to do? You want to hold the block loop for the longest and keep it away from the other robot? You want to touch it or get close to it. You want to minimize your distance from the cube and maximize the distance from the other robot from the cube. So we've got two fitness functions. We've got robot creature one or robot one on the left here and creature two or robot two on the right here. This is the fitness function for robot one. This is the fitness function for robot two. We'll just focus for a moment on robot one. It's trying to maximize D2. You can see there's a plus sign to the left of D2. So robot one is trying to maximize or gets fitness points for maximizing D2, which is the distance of robot two from the block. And robot one is also at the same time trying to minimize D1. There's a minus side, 
minus sine to the left of d1, trying to minimize d1, which is its own distance from the block. We're normalizing by distances here. Same thing for robot two. It's trying to maximize the other robot's distance from the cube and minimize its own. Yeah, pretty straightforward. One last detail I wanted to point out here about this competition task. Uh, at the beginning of the simulation, he puts creature one over here and creature two over here. It has to be behind its starting line but it also has to be below this sloping ceiling that slopes up and away from the starting line. Seems like a weird detail. Why is that in there? Absolutely. Perverse instantiation raises its ugly head again, right? You use these fitness functions and you evolve robots with arbitrary bodies and arbitrary brains. Easiest thing for evolution to do, make a single tall cube that falls and lands and covers the cube. Yeah? So the creatures have to be built so that they fit underneath the ceiling. So if you wanna be tall, that's fine, but you're gonna get pushed further and further back as you get evolved to be taller and taller, yeah? Okay, so this was just a guard added retroactively to guard against perverse instantiation. Okay, uh, last detail we're gonna see from this experiment. In this, uh, in this particular experiment, we have pairs of robots competing uh, against one another. We're back to this, uh, this particular kind of evolutionary dynamic I mentioned last time, which is co-evolution. In co-evolution, your own fitness value is not constant. Your fitness value, even if you don't change, or your children are identical to you over evolutionary time, if you stay in the same place in the fitness landscape, you don't necessarily stay at the same height. Your fitness doesn't necessarily stay the same because others may be evolving to become better and better at grabbing the cube. And if you don't innovate, you your fitness starts to drop. So in this experiment, in this experiment and any coevolutionary process, the fitness landscape is not a landscape, it's a fitness ocean. Heights at any given point, any given horizontal position are changing. Yeah? So how do we evolve creatures in this situation? First thing we could do is if we imagine our population, again, yet another graph here. E imagine each node here represents one robot in the evolving population. We could compute the fitness of every robot in that population by competing it against every one of the other n minus one robots in the population. That's what the edges here represent, all versus all. We take robot one, for example. We compete robot one against robot two, R1 against R3, R1 against R, R1 against R4, and so on. We get, we're gonna get back N minus one, F1s. How well did I do in all of those N minus one competitions? And you can set my fitness to the average of those N minus one values. Yeah. Okay, what's the problem with doing that? It's gonna give, give the evolutionary algorithm a very accurate assessment of the fitness for every robot in the population, but that's gonna come with a heavy cost. What is the cost here? It's gonna waste a lot of time. Waste a lot of time, how? Where is the time being wasted? You're going up against robots that like, are kind of like, like if you're just going up against like the robots that like, did well, then like you'd be evolving to like actually compete, but it, a lot of the robots would probably be like not very good. Okay. And it would just be kind of like a waste of time because like it, you didn't have to compete with them to like see that you would have done the same. Like if this is a robot that stands still and you just like do the same thing, it doesn't really matter. Got it. So you they, you don't necessarily need to compete against all the other n minus one robots. There may be two robots in the population that have basically identical structure and function. It's a waste of time, yeah? It's a big, it's a, it might be a waste of time, it's also a huge time investment, right? If we have N robots in the population, how many simulations do you have to run? 
We've got to compete every robot against every other robot in the population. Well, it's n squared. It's n squared, right? Not great. All of you are running an algorithm which now has O of n, meaning if you have n robots, you're running n simulations every generation. And some of you are already waiting quite a while for your result. Imagine if it was n squared, you know? Okay, so let's do the opposite. Let's just grab two robots at random in the population and compete them against one another. Grab another two robots that have not yet competed, compete them against one another. How many simulations do we need to run now? n divided by 2. Awesome. Even faster than your code base. What's the cost here? Why don't we just do that? I mean, if you compete the two best ones against each other, you end up throwing out the ones that were really good. But... Absolutely, right? You can be really unlucky. You're the second best robot in the population. You get teamed up with the best robot in the population. You can also be really lucky, right? You get teamed up with the one who's just worse than you. Yeah? Okay, so let's strike a compromise like the NCAA does. We'll do the final four. We'll compete pairs against one another and they'll move up to the next competition. We can get away with less simulations. Still a problem, right? You could still be the second best teamed up against the best robot in the population at that time. So what Sims actually ended up using and what produced the robots you saw in the video last time is all versus best. What does this mean? In the very first generation, when he had random neural network, had random uh, genotypes and n random robots, he did all versus all. So he ran n squared simulations, which took a while on the CM5 supercomputer at that time, but got an accurate estimate of the fitness of each of the n robots and found the best one in the population, remembered which one was the best, deleted the ones that were uh, poor and made randomly modified copies of the surviving genotypes. And in generation one, the second generation, he did not do all versus all, he did n minus 1 simulations where he competed each of the n minus 1 robots here against the best one from the previous generation. So pretty fast, n minus 1 simulations. And it guards against this problem of the second best having to go up against the best robot in the population. Why? How does, how does this solve the problem? can rank them instead of like um, just disqualifying them? Absolutely, you can rank them now. So th this is by definition the best or was the best robot in the previous generation, got the highest fitness. And let's say this particular robot here is actually the second best. It's going to get a particular fitness value versus this competitor. This one, if this was the third best robot, is gonna get a fitness score slightly less than the second best one. This one still gets a score slightly less than this one. Yeah? If through mutation and recombination, some other robot appears that actually does better than the best robot, you can imagine what's going to happen in generation two, the third generation. It now becomes the best, and everyone has to compete against that particular robot. Yeah? Pretty efficient. OK. So again, we kind of went through this. This is very inefficient. It's n squared. This is very efficient, n over 2. This is uh, of order n minus 1. Same thing here. Yeah? This is one way to do it where we have one population, the big gray circles here. Another thing that Sims tried is to create an evolutionary algorithm in which there are two separate populations. We create n random genotypes in one population and then another n random genotypes in a second population and compete every individual from the first population against every individual in the second population uh, and so on. Do the same thing here with uh, just randomly teaming everyone up and then do the all versus best trick between these two species. What do, you think, what do you think happens between these two different kinds of experiments, these two different experiment variants? 
What kind of evolutionary dynamics do you think you tend to see? How do, how do things change over evolutionary time in this experiment? And how do you think change, things change over evolutionary time in this experiment? In the second experiment, you're going to get things that can be like different classes of um, robots. But in the first experiment, you'll just get things that are like specialized at beating like the thing that's the best of those. OK. so. In the second in the second experiment here with two different populations, remember our discussion about the evolution of teamwork and specialization and communication? There's a, a greater chance of getting specialization here. The ones in here are going to look and act different because they need to have strategies that defeat these and vice versa. In here, things tend to get all mixed up and you get sort of less variety. Yeah? Okay. We'll end, we'll end with this slide here. We saw the videos last time. What you're looking at in each of these four panels are four separate evolutionary runs using algorithm variant G down here. So this is basically A, B testing. Here's A here, here's B. But he did C, D, E, F, and G as well. So we're looking at algorithm variant G, remember, which has two populations. What he's plotting in the topmost panel here is one run, one run of this G variant. We have evolutionary time in generations on the horizontal axis as always, and fitness on the vertical axis here. In I think every fitness plot we've seen in this course so far, fitness is either monotonically increasing, if the fitness function uh, higher fitness values is better, or monotonically decreasing if the, in the fitness function lower values are better. This is not the case here. Why? We're plotting, sorry, the, the, the gray and the black line here, average fitness of species one, average fitness of species two. Why is it not, monot why is fitness in these two populations not monotonically increasing or decreasing? You're not just selecting the best of the fitness. Like normally what we were doing was like taking the population, taking the best one, checking to see if it was better than the thing before. And if it was, we included it so that so it only go up or down. But this you're just taking the average of all the results. So it's just not gonna uh, true. We could they or Sims could have plotted the individual in the black population that had the highest fitness and also the individual from the gray population that had the highest fitness at that point in evolutionary time, and you would have got some more or less the same picture. You would have got something that is not necessarily monotonically increasing or decreasing. Why? Is it because from generation to generation, sometimes out of the whole population, there wasn't a robot that was better than the, the best one? Uh, th th yes, that is true. Uh, that did happen. Sometimes the best from the previous generation was surpassed by some new child in the population. But that doesn't explain why we get this non-monotonic uh, pattern here. What's going on here? Let's start at the beginning of this evolutionary run. So at the beginning, in the, in the gray population and the black population, we have random genotypes that produce random robots that are probably both equally horrible at getting near the cube. But over 25 generations, the uh, individuals in the black population are getting higher fitness than the individuals in the gray population. What, what's happening here? Fitness is actually going down among the, the individuals in the gray population. Oh, it's because they're competing. They're competing, right? So the individuals in the black population are getting better and better at approaching the block and or possibly getting better at pushing the gray robots further and further away from the block, and they're suffering, the, the gray robots are suffering for it. What happens around generation 25 in this particular evolutionary run? You actually saw several examples of it in the video that we showed last time, when we saw the pairs competing over the block in the middle. Up until generation 25 or so, the black robots are doing better at this task, are competing, out-competing the gray robots. What happens? 
Can't the gray robot copy the strategy? Okay, it can't copy the strategy because they're genetically distinct, right? Whatever happened in the gray population, someone in the gray population through random mutation and crossover came up with a strategy that, that worked against the black robots. That gray robot started to produce randomly modified copies of itself that were even better at defending against the black strategy to the point where now the gray individuals are rising in their fitness ocean. They're going up and at the same time the black robots, which presumably at this point are practicing more or less the same strategy their ancestors did back here, doesn't work anymore. Eventually, they start to evolve a counter strategy and a counter counter strategy and so on. And you get this seesawing effect. Yeah? This is very common in co-evolving populations. Lions evolve strategies to sneak up on antelope better Antelopes evolve faster speed or faster turning radius. The descendants of those lions evolve a different sneak up strategy. The antelopes evolve a new counter strategy and on and on forever. What happens in population uh, in the third uh, independent run here? Or what happened past tense? One got so good that the other didn't compete. One got so good, the, the black robots evolved a strategy that was so good that every, pretty much every other robot in the gray population had a fitness of zero or whatever the worst value was. So what happened to the, the, gray, the, the gray population is their ocean basically dried up and they landed on the, on the dry seabed. It was perfectly flat. Wherever they moved horizontally, nothing worked. So evolution didn't know how to move the population towards a strategy that might eventually outcompete the black population. This also happens in co-evolutionary processes where one species gets temporarily so good, it drives lots of other species to extinction. Yeah? It's happening on this planet right now. Okay. All right, we have three minutes left, so I'm just going to introduce uh, lecture 25 here on soft robots. In this lecture, we're going to look, not surprisingly, at robots that are made from soft materials. Why does that matter? Why don't we just continue making robots from hard plastic and steel and ceramics? Why make robots out of plastic and rubber? Robustness how? Well, if you have like a rigid body, they're less flexible. There's less things that you can do. There's less things you can do if you're a rigid body. And although we have a soft exterior, we are basically rigid animals, right? There's only so much you can do. What can soft animals do that we can't do? A robot or animals that are softer than us. What is a particular soft animal that always steals the animal documentary show? It's always showing up in animal videos. The go-to animal. The octopus. What can the octopus do that we can't do? So when lecture ends here in two minutes, I'm going to cut a two centimeter hole in the glass door, and you got to go out through the hole. Don't try this at home. It's got to get its beak through the one hard part of the octopus. It just got its beak through. There we go. OK. You can imagine for a lot of search and rescue operations, it would be very useful to create uh, soft robots that are large so that they can move la large distances, 
But at the same time, if they come up against an obstruction, like a debris field or a collapsed building, that they can also deform their bodies to move through very small apertures. On Thursday, we will see some evolved robots that do exactly that. Thanks very much. You have a quiz due tonight. Undergrads, you're continuing to work on A-B testing, as are the grad students. Have a good rest of your day.